Dr. Joseph Mercola, who is a pretty renowned, I want to say, holistic type health person, reported this past week that according to the most recent Household Pulse survey conducted by the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics, that 27.3% of American adults now struggle with depression and or anxiety. And that is in addition to the 40 million Americans who report substance use disorders and the additional 14 million who have more serious mental illnesses. That's a pretty stunning amount of people. Christian Drake, a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at NYU Grossman School of Medicine writes, Every day, people call my office looking for help. A loved one has not left their bed in a week. A father is experiencing panic symptoms while preparing his children for school. A young woman is using substances in a way that feels dangerous to her. These are all people in crisis. Their conditions are complex and acute and require the expertise of a psychiatrist who can talk to them, assess possible medical causes for their problems, manage withdrawal, prescribe medications when needed, and connect with other providers. Before the pandemic, I could almost always help. I would be able to find time to meet with someone for a consultation or make a few calls to secure the right referral. But now, my every available hour, even those that, are, that jut into my ability to meet my obligations to my family, they're all full. My colleagues tell me the same. They are starting work earlier, working later, contending with long wait lists and their own limits. All the while, patients in crisis are going without psychiatric help. There are 33,000 practicing psychiatrists in the United States. If all of us were treating only people with depression or anxiety, each of us would have to see more than 3,000 patients a year. Drake says, in short, there aren't enough practicing psychiatrists to handle the tsunami of mentally unwell Americans. There also aren't enough residency positions available to significantly expand the profession anytime soon. Kat Lonsdorf reports that trauma typically involves some kind of life-threatening event or something that leaves you feeling fearful and or helpless. Many who have religiously followed mainstream news over the past two years have clearly been traumatized feeling as though death is imminent and there's no escape. A death-dealing blow in some form of an invisible virus could come from anyone, including loved ones. No one is safe to be around. What's more, the pandemic wasn't an isolated incident that could be processed and recovered from. A psychologist with expertise in collective trauma likens the pandemic to a slow-moving disaster that escalated in intensity over time and to this day does not have an endpoint. Not everyone agrees that what we are seeing is a result of collective trauma. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, author of The Body Keeps the Score, one of the most sold out books on Amazon during the pandemic, is very hesitant to categorize the pandemic as a collective trauma. He tells Lonsdorf, we need to be very precise because if we don't know what we're treating, we may give the wrong treatment. He believes we need a new term, a new language to accurately label our circumstances. That's really what I'm encouraging us to do, to really identify what is making us all feel like we are barely hanging on. Living under constant threat has serious health consequences of physical health. Fear weakens our immune system, can cause cardiovascular damage, gastrointestinal problems such as ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, decreased fertility. It leads to accelerated aging, premature death. It affects the memory. It impairs formation of long-term memories, it causes damage to certain parts of the brain such as the hippocampus. This can make it even more difficult to regulate fear and leaves a person anxious most of the time. To someone in chronic fear, the world looks scary and their memories will confirm that. Brain processing and re reactivity is also affected. Fear can interrupt processes in our brains that allow us to regulate emotion, read nonverbal cues, and other information presented to us, reflect before acting, and act ethically. This impacts our thinking and decision-making in very negative ways, leaving us susceptible to intense emotions and impulsive reactions. All of these effects can leave us unable to act appropriately. It also affects our mental health, 
Um, other consequences of long-term fear include fatigue, clinical depression, and PTSD. So that's the world speaking to us right now about what kind of a pressure it's under with the state of things. That's the world. That's the message they're giving. The main fears that people are dealing with are the fear of death, which is the fear of death, dying or ceasing to exist, fear of harm, things that would cause harm to us or things we own like bad weather or a dangerous pet, fear of our personal, um, our person, experiences that would affect us like shame, rejection, failure, we fear that, or fear the unknown, things that are out of our control, fear of the unknown right now is crippling because it kind of involves all of those fears. It kind of intertwines with them all. All I can say is I don't watch the news because I've decided I've had enough long time ago. It doesn't impact me better to watch it, to know more. It doesn't help me. There's nothing I can do about it. I would rather keep my mental health and be able to give people hope. So I'm not trying to keep up on everything. But what I am thankful for is that there are two kingdoms at play here. That is one kingdom, but there is another kingdom, and I am part of the other kingdom. God has an entirely different kingdom and a solution available to all who will come to him for hope and healing. And so um, I remember um, earlier years of my life just tormented by the future and what would happen to me. I mean, I faced imminent threats frequently. My own addiction caused that, addictions, plural. And so my lifestyle was uh, just a disaster. So there was many reasons for me to become afraid. But there's nothing, you can't really explain torment to someone unless they know what torment is because it's just so hard to explain it and how all-consuming it is. But I do not face that regarding the world because I'm of a different kingdom. And we have a different, um, we have a book written about our kingdom that tells us what our purpose is in it. And it also tells us that um, this isn't going to go well. This isn't going to be smooth and to expect hardship, to expect suffering. And I feel like I mastered hardship and suffering as a sinner. In the other kingdom, I made a full practice of both. I can, I feel I am equipped for this kingdom. As a result, I am not, I do not like hardship and suffering, but I know that I can do it. And if I'm doing it for Christ, I'll do it for Christ because I did it for myself for many years. I'd much rather do it for Christ. So our side, the kingdom of God, has a, is the only kingdom that has a solution for fear. The only kingdom. There are five types of fear spoken of in the Bible. Most believers are left thinking from being told things and hearing songs that we are no longer slaves to fear. Sermons say you are a brand new creature. I remember being told that when I was first saved and I'm thinking, well, what about this? What about this? But without needed discipleship, that is definitely not going to be the case. And that's the problem. When you don't have churches that are discipling people, they don't teach them the Bible. They don't teach them the overall message of the cross, what it means. When there's just um, topical sermons, but no discipleship, people don't come to understand anything about um, the state that they're in and what needs to happen to bring them out of um, the different things that may still hold them captive in their soul. So until you identify, repent of, and break strongholds, which the Bible commands us to do, and other sins and agreements in our life, they will stay as squatters and act out of your soul. The Bible has a lot to say about this. It talks about the fear of God in the Bible. Proverbs 1 teaches us to fear God and that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The word is translated better as awe. 
that we are to be in awe of God. We are to have a holy fear of a holy God. He sees all, he knows all, and our desire should always be to please him. And when we know that he sees and knows all, it should be easier for us to want to do the right thing even when no one is looking because he is looking. He does know. He, in fact, reads our mind. He knows what our thoughts are. Another fear in the Bible is fear of man, and that's when we fear what others will think of us. We fear what others may do to us, say to us, and Jesus was very clear when he told us not to worry about what to do or say if we're brought before kings and judges. He also said parents are going to betray children, children will betray parents, brother will betray sister, but we are to fear God the most because he's the one who could put our soul in hell. So we are not to fear man for any reason. We are to only fear God, the one that has the ultimate control of what happens in our lives. Another is fear of ourself. We have weaknesses, we have distorted thinking, we have feelings of inadequacy, we feel like failures, but these are normal. They need to be resolved because they are not they have to be resolved so that we don't have them paralyzing us and keeping us from obeying God because he wants us to do things that those very things will hold back or negate us from doing because we don't feel called or equipped for it. That's why if you have any of those feelings, they must be dealt with. Another reason why discipleship is critically needed. Another fear is fear of danger. This comes when we face a threat of any kind. It's an internal warning system that God gives us, and at the appropriate time, it is good. We are to turn to God and ask for help. We're also called to obey, so we are, again, not to be paralyzed by this fear either. We need to resolve the fear of danger and make sure that it's appropriately used because if we fear things that are not... Some of us have so much imagined danger because of previous trauma that that becomes then just complete bondage. Another is a fear, a spirit of fear, and that is sent by the devil. And this one has to be confronted and it has to be kicked out. It has to be commanded to leave. And I will address that more towards the end. But fear can easily become a prison once we know better and we sin and we disobey God, that sin will immediately start to build a prison and we'll hide from God, we'll hide from others. We often will even hide the truth from ourselves. We just can't face, oh, here I did this again. We fear God's response to our sin, even though he has been, he's been so clear about how he will respond to our sin if we call on him and bring it to him. He's been very clear how merciful he is, how quickly willing he is to forgive. But for some reason, we come up with a different script and we fear how he will see us or treat us and we don't go to him. We start to identify with our sin. So people start calling themselves out by the sin that has captured them again, even though it were a moment. They say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm a thief, I'm an adulterer, when we should never identify by our sin, ever. We have been given an identity as the son or daughter of the Most High God, and there is absolutely no reason for us to abandon that and to become known as an addict or some other flavor of sin any kind of identity preference either. That is moot, a moot point in the kingdom. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's the only option for us. So if you are a believer, you don't have to run around and figure out what your gender is. You don't have to run around and figure out all these different things because it doesn't matter. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. It's what he thinks that matters, not what we think. We gave that up. We abandon all those choices of identity because we can identify as a child of God, period. There is no reason that we should abandon being a child of God to go take on the identity of sin. That's actually abandoning the kingdom and you don't wanna do that. 
We become trapped by fear, unable to experience the freedom of this relationship with God. When fear takes over, we hide from especially God for some reason. Our fear keeps us in bondage. And whether we're fearful of the future, becoming ill, a global virus, job loss, we often end up turning away from and hiding from God. That is just the result of a spirit of fear, which is only allowed access when we agree with it. When we say, yes, that is true. Come in, be part of me. I agree with this fear. That's how it takes over. The relationship and line to hope and healing is broken by our choice to embrace fear. So through prayer and worship in God's presence, we can turn back to the one, the only one who is able to move us out of fear into freedom. And this gift is available to those who repent and choose to follow Jesus Christ. It is not available to any others. It is only available to those who have been born again, according to the Bible standard. And that means you accepted that Jesus laid down his life for you. Now you are laying down your life for him. So you no longer keep rights to your own life. Sometimes the enemy of our soul uses fear to remove our focus on what God may be calling us to do. So instead of focusing on fear, we should just automatically know and move in being called to serve those around us. That is an automatic. So when fear's coming up on you and you're saying, oh, I'm scared, I don't wanna leave my house. There's a million things you can do, even sitting in your own house. You can start reaching out to people through a positive way to do, use social media. There's so many different things you can do if you can't leave your house. More things you can do if you do leave your house, but you should always divert immediately to, I'm not gonna focus on fear, I'm going to serve others. And when we turn our focus to ourselves, we abandon serving others. That's just a byproduct of focusing on ourselves, which is what all of us in addiction know addiction is. It's the core of it is a self obsession. Focus on loving others instead of your fear is an act of obedience to God. Fear will make you listen to all the other voices and the voices in the world are very loud and there's many of them. Oftentimes they're inside your own house. Some of them can be inside your own head. Your past talks to you, previous relationships talk to you. Whenever you choose a path outside of the path the mass has chosen, these voices will start rising up in opposition to your life because going against the crowd can be really fearful if you are not confident in where you are going or who you are following. So you, if you don't know your God and you start going opposite of culture, you're going to get hammered by them. So this is a very good reason to know the God that you follow because that path is not going to be easy, but fear will cause many to turn from that path because of the, just the significant voices that are gonna start coming at them. If you know your master and you know that he is the only safe place for you to be, you're able to turn a deaf ear to those who are not on the same path. Fear also creates hurdles to obedience. The promises of God throughout the Bible are many. If you are allowing your fear to create obstacles to believing God's promises for you, you're going to run into um, a lot of roadblocks because you won't get anywhere where God has called you to go. He promises never to leave or abandon us in Hebrews 13:5. He says he knows the plans he has for us, plans for our well-being, not for disaster, Jeremiah 29, 11. We are to never allow fear to create an obstacle to believing and walking in obedience because God is far greater than any fear you will ever face. Fear will also stop us from facing the battle. Second Chronicles 20, 17 says, you do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. So our world is pretty full at this point of difficulty, pandemics, broken relationships, chronic addictions, mental illness. These things are 
insurmountable in the minds of many, and they seem too great to conquer. So the way out is acknowledging the weakness, that we know it's there, position ourselves before God, and face the battle, because God says he'll do the fighting for you. If you look to him for the next step to take, he will give it to you. Simply ask him to help you stand, face your enemy, and trust him to fight through to victory for you. That's what he's asking to do. Not to make you fight it. He says, you come stand with me, I will fight for you. Fear also causes us to doubt the Bible and doubt the wisdom of those who are giving us sound biblical counsel. Doubt will prevent us from believing God is who he says he is. And when fear is causing doubt, you have got to ask God for more faith. Another great consequence is that God's truth will be forgotten when you allow fear to drown it out in your mind. Difficulties in life can cause fear and make you not remember the truth that God has spoken into your life many times before. The promises of God that he made to you are dim. You wonder if you even heard him correctly. Was that even true that I heard that? Did I imagine that? And the situation becomes very difficult. Fear has taken over. God's perfect peace is tested when we allow fear into our circumstances. We will continue to experience fear until we cast it down. It will not leave until we do. Through God's word and prayer, we can turn our focus to God, step out in obedience, and again, choose to love and serve those around you so fear will stop controlling you. Get your mind off yourself. God will fight whatever battle is ahead of you. Stand, know your weakness, face the battle, and remember the ways he has cared for you in the past and focus on the truth of his word. And that is probably the greatest advantage I have is that I can look back. I've been in things where I thought, there's no way I'm gonna see the good in this. There's just no way, there's no possible good to be in this. But I can still look back now and see that because some of the greatest I would say some of the worst parts of my character were torn down in those times. So it isn't even about the situation as about what God allowed it to do in me. Um, He uses those things that there's just possibly nothing good that I could, I don't even want to remember it to strip me of pride and control and fear. He, He allows it for that reason because my character will not submit to God. And that's how it happens is some outrageous thing happens. It almost flattens me in life. And then when I come through on the other side, I can't look back and say, oh, that was awesome. I can look back and say, wow, that really changed me. And generally in a very good way, because that's the direction I'm going. It can change people in a very bad way, but I'm moving towards a different kingdom. There are signs that someone is being controlled by a spirit of fear one is they are feeling unloved by god this is a pretty important indicator that you're suffering from a spirit of fear when you feel that god doesn't love you or you're unsure of his love for you this is rooted in unbelief in an unwillingness to trust that he's good It basically is negating everything he has ever said in his word. So if that's the belief that you're under, that God doesn't love you, doesn't see you, or you're not sure, you have got a massive something going on in your life because that should not be there. The enemy would like nothing better for us than to believe that God is rejecting us because of whatever we've done or been or um, where we came from. When we're feeling unseen or forgotten, that's when we especially need to run to him. Psalm 32, 7 says, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And sometimes it's hard to believe God loves us when life is just hard. And it can be hard to trust that God loves us and more so has a good plan for our lives. But to fear that he doesn't have those things is opposite of faith and of what he says. 
if we know that God loves us, he says, what do you have to fear? First John 4, 18 says, there's no fear in love. Perfect fear, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So there's that problem. God loves us or God's a liar. There's just no other options. We can't afford to have the option floating in our head that God is not telling the truth. He has more than proved it, more than ever proved it, when he sent his only son to earth to die in our place. He does not need to prove it. We need to draw close to him, read the word, listen to the word, study the word, speak the word, listen to the word, speak the word, study the word, because if we do that, the Bible is alive and active, God says it is, we will see his perfect love drive out fear. The word, the word is the answer. If you're not in it, that's a choice, then you're letting fear remain. Avoiding the Bible, church and prayer is another sign of fear being in control. There's three responses to danger, fight, flight, or freeze. And at times this causes us to flee from everything that might help us. So avoiding God might be intentional. You might not even know you're doing it, but you must consider, why don't I wanna to go to church anymore? You really need to answer that question. And it isn't about what the church is doing for you because you're supposed to be the church. You're supposed to bring to them. So it's not that I don't like the church, I don't wanna go. It is, you are the church. If you belong to Jesus, you are the church and you are to bring the church you're to be there. So you have to ask yourself, why am I exempt from that? Because whatever the answer is, it'll show you where you've gone off or get very close to it. It also causes us to not read the Bible People give up reading their Bible. They give up being in the Word. They also start cutting off certain topics. So you can't talk about certain things because they don't want to hear it. They start slamming down fences on what can be discussed. So when you get like that, you can be sure the enemy has moved in because separating you from the Word is a, it's going to result in death. There's just no other way. There's no other way. Death to your spirit, death to your life. It's a very dangerous trajectory to fall into. Instead of bringing a problem to God, they, they want to avoid completely dealing with it. Stay away from God. Stay away from Christians. Stay away from the Bible. If you're avoiding God, remember, he's the only one who really can help you get free. He is the only one that can get you free from fear. Jesus told us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. That's what God says. So if that's not your experience, you're eating from the wrong table, and you need to decide if that's what you want to keep getting, or if you want a different outcome, if you want peace and to be rid of fear, you're going to have to switch what you're consuming. Also, people have difficulty engaging in relationships. That's another signal of fear. This applies to romantic partners, friends, family, peers, coworkers, reasons being fear of rejection, fear of being hurt, fear of being responsible for someone else having to give something up for others, fear of becoming dependent. Regardless, yielding to a spirit of fear is going to keep you from following the greatest commandment in regards to people, which is love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 31. So that hurts not only those around us, but ourselves. When we start isolating, that's always bad. It's always bad, unless you're doing a, a two day if unless you're on some kind of a sabbatical that's planned, but isolating because you don't want to be around people is never good if that's extended. God made us for relationships, and it's difficult to love if we've been hurt, but I guarantee you it's a lot more difficult to move ahead without love than it is to 
move ahead and risk being hurt. Because when you're alone with your own head, some of us have done that. We know what that is. There's nothing more wretched than that. However, it's easier when we realize that our most important relationships, our relationship in our life is the one with God and his people. That is where the safety is. That's where the growth is. That's where our family, our community is more so than biological. It is our God family. If he's our first great love and we lean on him, then even if others hurt or fail us, we are going to have a steady ground to stand on. Um, because people hurt people, that's just the way it is with people. Um, some of the best counsel I've ever been given is, you can expect that, people hurt people, that's what people do. But God does not hurt people. You cannot trust people, but you can always trust God. So if you have put your trust in God and you've put your heart in God's hands, you're going to keep you're going to keep standing because God is safe. So another sign is worry and indecision when making choices. That is also evidence of fear. When people become paralyzed in decision making and they stop because they're afraid they're going to make a wrong choice, I guarantee you in life you're going to make a lot of wrong choices. But if we stop living out of fear of making a wrong choice, we're going to make the biggest wrong choice we could possibly make in our life. Because no one gets to the end of their life and wishes they would have not done anything. It can be overwhelming. If we wonder what could happen if we make a mistake but that's the worst baggage that is the worst bondage to get in I see so many people trapped in that they stay in they're just stuck in jobs they hate stuck in relationships they hate because they're fearful of what will happen if they make a mistake if they're left alone if whatever there's so many ifs but I see so many people just trapped and miserable and angry and bound all because they are, their indecision is controlled by fear. And many times the fear inside of us makes us see consequences or problems or outcomes far more serious than they actually would be. But we just magnify the result. We have to, there's just no other option but to get alone with God he has a way of communicating with us when we really need to know or at least need peace. You need to lay these burdens down at his feet, move forward in the best thing you know to do, which we always kind of know what that is. But don't stay stuck. That is like the worst thing you can do. You stay stuck in it, just your whole life just tanks. God is always with us no matter what path we take. If you make a wrong step and a wrong choice, and you're connected to God, he is God, he can bring that back around to a much greater end than would have ever happened if you hadn't made a mistake. He can redeem mistakes better than, what God can do with the biggest mistakes of my life is so stunning to me. I just think all these different things that I have going for me right now, I would not even have that if I hadn't done this other terrible thing in my life, but God has taken that, that choice, that decision that caused great harm to me and probably someone else, I've laid it down. I don't want it. I've repented of it. And then God turns it into like a mighty weapon in the kingdom. When making decisions, we need to remember Psalm 119, 105 that says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. So follow God's leading. Walk in obedience. We always know what God would want as far as obedience. If you walk in disobedience, correct quickly. Move forward confident that God has your life in his hands. Trust me, he knows we're going to get this wrong a lot. So he's fully capable of turning all the wrong, the ways we go off the path. He is very capable of making that into something amazing. Compromise is another marker of fear. 
compromise is essential when you're married or in a family. At, there's many times that you have to come to compromise, but compromising on morals, never, never compromise on your morals. And fear will cause that to happen. That especially happens in relationships when people want to keep someone. I, I did it. I know a lot of people that have done that. But mostly I did that. Um, that's a common thing is what I'm saying. It's very common that people can uphold morals until they get in this one certain relationship. And then they just throw it to the wind because this person is so captivating. When a person's so captivating that you are toying with letting go of your morals, run, run before you even spend another minute with them. The cost at the end is going to be so great to you. It's going to be far greater than you ever planned. And when it seems like it's the only way to keep going, to keep others happy, to get what we want, many will compromise morals. We will do things we know we shouldn't do or not do things that we should do all in order to get what we want. We think, will God really care if I repent when I'm done? That's not repentance. That is definitely not repentance. That is mocking repentance. Will he care if we deny him around certain people as long as we pray afterwards? That is also very dangerous. Very dangerous to be in willful sin like that, to forsake Christ, to be ashamed of him in front of others. Does God really mean we shouldn't cheat on our spouse with porn? Is he really serious we shouldn't steal on our taxes, pay ourselves for time at work when we actually weren't working? When we compromise, we're essentially saying we do not trust God to take care of us. We don't believe when he says we are going to reap what we sow. And he doesn't want us drowning in the consequences of our wrong choices because he knows how trustworthy we are or aren't. If he's our true promoter and he knows in the small things we're not trustworthy, we're not getting promoted. We think we need to do things our way and this stems from a spirit of fear often, a fear that God will not keep his promises for us and we have to do it ourselves. Without God, we should fear. We have no control over the world, no control over weather, our health, other people, nothing. We have no control. No matter how much preparation we make, how many bunkers people want to build, how much they want to store up, there's no control over what will happen. But God has all control. The God, the one who's saying, come to me, come near to me, he has all control. He knows exactly what's going on and what's going to happen next. And the only way to fight fear is to put your trust in God. Because again, he said in 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear and his, perf his love is perfect. So if we believe what God says, that his love is perfect and know that he loves us, we have no reason to fear because he said he loves us and we should not fear because his eye is always on us. When we forget, we need to turn back to the Bible and read the same promises. We can pray to him. We can talk to others that are walking with Jesus, the closer we come to him, the more we will not fear. So if you have fear, you're too far away from God. That's simple. It's that simple. It may take time, but we must allow God's love to cast out fear. There's a good chance that all fears will not be conquered this side of heaven, but we can come a long way and we can live mostly in peace, knowing that God has the last word on every single thing that comes our way, even taking the things that he maybe wouldn't have chosen for us and spinning them for our good. He promises to do that. He is the best one to trust our life to. We sometimes fall victim to fear either because we lack knowledge about God's promises in the Bible or we lack faith to believe that they're true. That is a choice, both of those things. If you want to be free from fear, you are going to have to seek the promises out. You're going to have to learn them. You're going to have to know them and you're going to have to apply them. That's the part you get to do. If you don't do that, you won't get them. The best way to overcome wrong kinds of fear is a true love for God. One answer. 
We're not afraid to fall asleep if we're surrounded by those who love and protect us. So when a person loves God and has faith in him as the master of the universe, we don't need to be a slave to fear. Abnormal fears can grip us, such as any more war, nuclear war, criminal damage to just the melee that's going on around our city, fear of losing a job or a relationship. Once we know that God is all, he's our present and involved father. He's always going to stay with us. He's always going to help us when we ask. We can truly become free of fear. We conquer fear by looking to Jesus. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Fear leaves in the presence of Jesus. Jesus often introduced himself with the words, it is I, do not be afraid. In Old Testament times, he repeated these words over and over again. He never wasted words. He repeatedly said, fear not, be not afraid, do not be anxious. He knows that many people are tossed all over, but Psalm 46, 1 to 2 and 11, thank you, says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, Will we not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? The Lord of hosts is with us. That's amazing right there. Psalm 46, 1 through 2 and 11. I'm going to read it again. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. That's pretty significant. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea also significant. The Lord of hosts is with us. So our time and our life here on earth is in God's hands. If we choose him, we have to choose him. He, he wants all, but unfortunately there's a matter of choice on our part. Nothing can harm us if we are his, apart from what has his permission. If he permits it, he plans to use it for our good. We must trust him every minute. We must keep unshakable faith and belief that God has everything under control and that nothing can harm us beyond his plan. He says it, we need to believe it because we're constantly under the shadow of the Almighty. Read Psalm 91 every single day. I don't know how many people have told me that. I have it on my mirror in my bathroom because so many people say, if you want to live free of fear, read Psalm 91 every single day. It works. Read Psalm 91 every day. We need to exchange our fear for trust. Fear not is found 365 times in the Bible, one for each day of the year. Could be a coincidence, but I doubt it. There's much in this world that will make us afraid, but there's far more in the Bible to make us unafraid. It's right there. Bible's everywhere. It's right there. If you pick it up, it's right there. Jesus didn't promise that he would be with us some of the days. He promised he would be with us at all times, even unto the end of the age. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, and if you've been saying, I want to run my own life, I want to do what I want to do, I want to be in charge of my days, I'm still going to say I'm a Christian, though, because I believe in Jesus. You have many reasons to be afraid. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if one is not prepared to meet him. I was reading to them tonight some of the last words of people before they died, and it, it's crazy what people will say when they're dying. You don't want to be unprepared to meet him at any time, because I'm guessing most of these people didn't know they were going to die at the moment they did. But you can find peace with God. He does not make that hard to do. He tells us how to come to him, under what conditions. He begs every person to commit their eternity to him. He doesn't want anyone to go lost. If anyone goes lost, they chose to go lost. If you let him, Jesus will take all of your fears and he replaces them with hope, security, and peace. I'm going to leave you with 10 Bible verses that will remind you of who God is when you're robbed of your peace. Second Timothy, I'll, I'll put these in the comments. 
um, I'll put them in the comments too. 2 Timothy 1 7 for the Spirit of God does not for the Spirit of God gave the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Fear has no place in the life of a Christian. Two, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. De Deuteronomy 31, 6. If you're living your life according to the will of God, he promises he will never leave you or forsake you. Stay in the word. Three, Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this was David talking about um, when, when he was a shepherd and he was referring to God as his shepherd for Luke 12, 25, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? It's very easy to do that. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, why do you worry? It doesn't add a single thing. It just steals. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's big. There's really no way to mistake that. Nothing. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It was David again. When we are in Christ, the devil is terrified of us. When we know we are in Christ, the devil is terrified of us. He is terrified of us. Psalm 111, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The theme is obviously do not fear, for I am with you in all of these verses. Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I have to ask, you need to ask yourself if you're ready to die, if you believe in Jesus, the master of the universe. To be ready to meet him means that you have chosen to turn from sin. You have abandoned sin. You have allowed him into your daily life to transform you into who he wants you to be. That's when you're ready to meet God. If you haven't arrived at that place, you have a lot to worry about. Don't waste any more time finding Jesus because we have no idea what, what will happen in the next 10 minutes. Psalm 46, one through three, God is our refuge and strength, our ever present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, same verse, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, We have to trust God. If we're not going to believe what the Bible says, then we get fear. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know in whom I have believed, and I am convinced he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. We can trust God. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God's word is very clear. Those who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ or the born again have no reason to fear the evil that has fallen on this world. We have no reason to fear anything. The story's already written for us. None. No reason for fear. The Bible has so much more to say about fear and God knows that we tend to be fearful. So he's filled the Bible with all kinds of encouragement from fear. He gave us the Bible for a reason so that we could read it and be healed so that it could bring us peace and life through the Holy Spirit. 
You have to ask God to overcome your fear if you are strapped in fear, which many are according to the statistics. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. The purpose of Seven Bells is prayer ministry. So we deal a lot with strongholds and different things that have people captive. And I think in most people, fear has always been something that's present. It's quite a wicked, um, it's a wicked enemy in side of you it's very adversarial and it robs you of lots of good things but especially god things you have to determine to obey god in this and in every way if you are a true follower of jesus your life is not your own you don't get to say you know what i don't want to go through what it takes to get free that's actually separating yourself from him You've got to face the fear head on. You have to pray and surrender to Jesus. That's the first step. And from that established relationship, you have authority to tear down strongholds of sin in your life. I know that's not preached a lot, but you have the authority to tear down the devil's work in your life. Because I know that this is not a common thing that people are given as um, hope that you can destroy the work of the enemy from all the way back into generations before you. You can free yourself from that. I'm going to put a prayer to declare, meaning speak out your mouth. I'm going to put a declaration prayer in the comments of this message so that you can declare and agree with God and take authority over that spirit of fear. Being born again is the only way you can get this freedom. So it will help you with that, that covenant decision. But that choice is critical. The choice to be born again is critical to entering heaven for one, because only the born again are going to heaven according to Jesus. But also to be free from fear as times continue to implode. Trust me, it's not going to get better. So you definitely want to deal with it now while you can. Precious Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you that you have given us a solution to something that is so crippling. It destroys us in every way if we let it live inside of us. I ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to absolutely blow up fear in lives all around that hear this just set on people and give them no rest until they separate themselves from serving and embracing fear. I ask you to work a miracle in all the lives of those that feel hopeless that they can ever become free, that this is such a massive crippling bondage that they don't even know how to start. But I ask you to work a miracle in them to do for them what they cannot do for themselves right now and set them free. We curse the fear in them and we loose your Holy Spirit into its place and ask you to deliver them from fear in Jesus name. Thank you for the fire of your Holy Spirit that will burn out the sin in those who want to be free. Thank you that you will bring them to a place of being born again and walking in the newness of life that ends up in heaven for eternity. Have your way, Lord Jesus. We want to see you high and lifted up on this earth before, before time is over. So please help us, Jesus, to stay faithful, to stay free from fear, and to be about your business here. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.